Good evening or good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you have logged in. Uh, welcome to this uh, CDDF webinar. My name is Jan Verwey. I'm the Managing Director of CDDF. And on behalf of my co-moderator, Professor Axel Glasmacher, like I said, welcome to this webinar. Um, before we start, a few things. Um, CDDF is devoted to the care of our cancer patients and to the acceleration and helping the acceleration of getting new drugs to our patients as rapid as is possible. And of course, make sure that those patients actually have access to those drugs. We do so by organizing webinars, uh, workshops, and an annual meeting. And this evening uh, and afternoon, we are presenting one of those uh, presentations, which is a webinar in this case. A few technical issues. Um, all of you are on mute. Uh, this is in order to preserve a good audio quality. If you have any technical issues in the quality of the audio or the screen, please report this to us via the chat function. CDF people are uh, available to help you out there. If you want to ask questions to the speaker, you can do so while he is speaking uh, by, and by using the uh, Q&A function, which on the right bottom side of your screen, you can type in your questions at the end of the lecture, Professor Glossman and I will read the questions and pose these to Professor Blay, uh, so you don't have to worry. We will take care that your question is being asked. For a better vis visuality, um, you can double click on the Zoom screen to enter into full screen mode, then you can at least read the slides in a, a more perfect way, I guess. Um, Today's agenda, uh, we will first have a presentation of Professor Blade that will last approximately 25 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A uh, session that we uh, will uh, last uh, approximately 30 minutes. So at the end of one hour, we will be ready to go for dinner or for leisure. Um, that's the program. First, however, we want to make you work. We have a few questions that we would like to ask you that relate to the content of the topic that Professor Blay will be addressing today. Three questions, actually. And we would like you to put in the answers uh, to all of the three questions at the same time. You can do so now. Please do so. Michael, can we see the uh, answers already? Okay, so basically to all three questions, the uh, answers are uh, true. Uh, COVID resulted in a major reduction of the numbers of patients included into clinical trials. The number of those newly diagnosed cancer patients decreased significantly during the first lockdown. Both of them have a percentage of uh, more close to 80, 90%. And trials dedicated to cancer patients with COVID were activated and included in record times. A lot of people also had the idea that this is true. So let's uh, listen to Professor Blay uh, whether this is actually true, which gives me the opportunity to introduce Professor Blay now. Uh, Jean Yves Blay is the current general director of the Centre Léon Bérard in Lyon, in France. Um, he's also the president of the French Federation of Cancer Centers, which is named UniCancer. His personal work in research was devoted to uh, sarcoma, to the large scale, and genomics, and he's also a world-renowned expert in immune, immune oncology. I can dwell on this for hours, but I don't think that's necessary. Uh, I would like to stop here and give the floor to Professor Blade. John Yves, please go ahead. Thank you, Yap. Uh, hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be with you uh, today to share with you some uh, of the experience of this Cancer Institute in the uh, operational aspect of uh, clinical trials in cancer during this COVID-19 pandemics. These are my disclosures as an investigator and also as the Director General of the hospital with uh, many, many different companies. 
And I wanted to start first with uh, something which was extracted from a public uh, website showing the magnitude of the problem. And the magnitude of the problem is 150 patients infected worldwide with 3 million, a bit more than 3 million deaths in the same period for a 2% death rate, which is of course extremely uh, important in this general population. And uh, probably even more so in patients with, uh, uh, with cancer. And these numbers are important because we are going to, uh, to see what is happening in cancer uh, patients in a few minutes, but they also um, should be put into perspective as compared to what was reported from na nationwide studies from our colleagues in Iceland, showing in a rigorous evaluation of the nationwide population uh, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, a death rate which is substantially lower in the range of 0.3%. So there may, may be reason for that, but this is something which we, we should have in mind. Anyway, uh, high death rate for a disease which is, uh, of course, extremely common now. Very early, looking at the, the magnitude of the problem in the cancer center where we work, as well as in all cancer centers from the uh, Unicancer, we took measures to ensure that patients could be protected. Uh, patient and healthcare wor workers. So these measures uh, were uh, uh, actually on several aspects. The first one being the uh, uh, the need that we have uh, to see the patient and only the patient. Uh, there were uh, no, no allowance for uh, family or other relatives to uh, join the patient during consultation and during hospitalization very early on. Of course, the measures to uh, detect um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, for patients coming to any consultation and the test which was done on the site uh, immediately. Uh, all protective measures led us to uh, something which, is, which has been observed for other hospitals specialized in cancer, which is a relatively low uh, risk of infection during both the first wave, first uh, six months of 2020, and the second wave at the second part of 2020, both for the healthcare workers and for the patients. And this is important because this I think is going to explain some of the numbers that I'm going to show you in a few minutes related to the um, participation of clinical trials. Because one of the questions we have, of course, when patients uh, do not uh, come to the hospital or, or uh, come through uh, with uh, um, uh, teleconsultation is how can we uh, help them to participate to clinical trials? And it was in interesting to look at that perspective, not only in this center, but also in the other comprehensive cancer center of the Unicancer Federation in France, which is uh, hosting actually 18 different hospitals on 20 different sites, uh, all purely comprehensive cancer center. And what is interesting, as you can see on this, uh, on this slide, is actually the total number of patients included into clinical trial in 2020 was very close to side, uh, that of uh, uh, 2019. There was a slight increase in the past years, every year, uh, for the uh, inclusion to clinical trial, which was not observed in 2020, but at least the number were relatively stable. Uh, how is that possible in a, in a context where, of course, uh, uh, the patients were, were facing uh, complexities to reach to the hospitals and the treatment sometimes? Well, um, there are several uh, explanations for that, but probably the most important uh, concern that we have very early was that of the severity of COVID-19 cancer patients. And we knew that actually from, from the uh, uh, experience reported very early from our colleagues from China showing an increased risk of death in patients with cancer presented with COVID. And on this slide, which uh, presents you actually the description of patients uh, who were uh, treated for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 in the first six months of 2020 in this center, we observe several interesting phenomena. And the first one is that not all patients with uh, symptoms of COVID-19 had uh, COVID-19 detected by uh, RT-PCR. Uh, these were patients at all stage of disease presenting with uh, uh, severe symptoms or detected with minimal symptoms. What is important is that if the patient had truly 
symptoms uh, of uh, respiratory uh, involvement, the outcome of the patient was very similarly to that, what was observed uh, by our colleagues in China, uh, a significant increase of the risk of death as compared to the 2% I was mentioning. Because in this series, you can see that about 20% of the patients with cancer with a documented or very suspected for instance, on CT scan, um, a COVID-19 infection were actually dead at uh, day 28. This was much lower in a population of patients with minimal symptoms, but still remain uh, very high. So why is that? We now know, of course, that the uh, patients with uh, COVID-19 in the context of cancer do have sometimes adequate immune response. And this was detected quite early. We did this work in this hospital. This was done in other hospital, showing an inappropriate immune response here in the case uh, of this uh, series, showing a reduced antibody uh, detection in patients who were, who were uh, presenting with COVID and cancer as compared to healthcare workers. And this was observed in particular in patients uh, who were previously, in the months before, treated with cytotoxic treatment or radiotherapy or immunotherapy. So uh, patients with cancer are frail towards COVID-19, and that was something which was later observed not only in this center, but in all centers of the French Federation. So this tells you also one thing, is that this uh, was actually part of a clinical trial I'm going to men mention at the end, uh, uh, co collecting clinical trials dedicated to COVID to collect the information on the natural history of these cancer patients is one of the explanations why actually the clinical research changed during uh, uh, this uh, uh, period of uh, pandemic in terms of nature of clinical trials. But this what slide also tells you is that you can see that patient with, uh, um, on the red curve, patient with documented COVID-19 uh, infection with or without ICRP level, which is so frequent in our, uh, in our patients with, uh, with cancer, has really a Dread, have really a dreadful prognosis and uh, uh, a short-term and mid-term uh, very high mortality uh, rate, very consistent with, with uh, uh, what was observed previously, even at a larger scale, even for patients without documented COVID, um, putting the physician who were uh, treating patients to clinical trial as, um, uh, uh, as very cautious to propose or not to propose a clinical trial to uh, to, to uh, these uh, to these patients. Now the good news, which is not necessarily very well known, but I want to share with you uh, today, is that things were improving. Of course, we now know that corticosteroids and uh, um, anti-coagulation -co uh, heparin can be prescribed for these patients, and this seems to have made a very significant change in this patient population, comparing wave one versus wave two of cancer patient infected with COVID, you can see here that the risk of early death is very significantly reduced in the second half of 2020 or right now as, as we speak. And this, of course, had uh, uh, an impact and has currently an impact on how we um, uh, treat the patient more and more according to standard uh, uh, guidelines uh, and not uh, um, avoiding at all price to put patients at risk uh, of, any, uh, of any treatment. Because that's really the, the, the problem, actually. And that was a problem of uh, delay to diagnosis and care, which was observed in all countries, uh, which was reported first by our colleagues from the UK, who were uh, warning us that uh, patients were not coming to the hospital. And actually, that's something, again, that we looked at in the French Federation of Cancer Center, including this hospital. Um, and you can see here in orange the hospitals which uh, uh, were in high incidence zones of COVID-19 as compared to the uh, other comprehensive cancer center in non-high incidence zone in the first COVID. What is interesting is that the reduction of the number of new patients was actually a relatively uh, identical in both, uh, uh, in both type of, uh, of region. By the way, I should here mention that the reduction of the number of cases of cancer was observed only in patients with newly diagnosed cancer. The number of patients with 
um, uh, a known diagnosis of cancer did not change in this period. So that's also one of the explanations why a cruel could be could could be cut because these patients were connected to us and we made sure that they could uh, follow uh, the uh, treatment to the to, to the guidelines. Anyway, when we look at uh, when we looked at the past year and when we looked at what happened in this first wave, obviously there was a reduction in 2020 of the number of new cases as compared to the regular increase of the number of uh, new cases in the past uh, in the past year. Who were the patients who were not coming? Uh, to cut a long story short, it was observed in all tumor types, um, and but preferentially in uh, in uh, women patients, mostly because of a reduction in breast cancer, which was a, a, of an important magnitude, slightly less in metastatic cancer patients. It was observed to, to a certain extent in uh, all tumor types, but uh, some tumor types such as aggressive tumors, hematological malignancies were less affected by this phenomenon. This is going to have an impact on patient outcome. This is not directly related to this uh, presentation. But I think that was nicely shown by, by our uh, UK colleagues that the uh, impact on long-term cure is going to be significant. And this is also what we calculated uh, on the basis of the observation in this uh, uh, network of uh, comprehensive cancer centers. So here we have a first problem of cancer patient being exposed to extremely high risk of death. And in second, and as a consequence to that, patient, in particular newly diagnosed patient, not coming to the hospital, or at least not coming uh, uh, as they should have been expected. So did this have uh, an impact on accrual or on activation on new trial? Well, if you look at this, uh, uh, at the present center uh, in the Centre Lambert where I work, Yes, it had an, uh, an impact. You can see, obviously, that although it is variable across the different tumor types, you can see that the uh, number of patients included in therapeutic clinical trials did drop uh, in 2020 as compared to uh, 2019. And this is very unusual because we have a steady 3 to 4% increase rate in the last 10 years or so. This was true for most disease, but not for all disease. And paradoxically, this was not observed for breast cancer, while this was one of the tumor where the incidence was, uh, uh, was most reduced or who were less coming to the, to the to the center, at least in our, in our experience. This happened also, and to a, a certain extent, largely in phase one studies. Not surprisingly, because there are studies where uh, the, where the procedures are, are more complex and where the benefit of the patient uh, is sometimes uh, debated uh, across physicians. Um, Overall, uh, if you look at this number, you, you can ask yourself why is that uh, that the total number of patients included into clinical trial did not change as much? Well, this is because of observational studies, which dramatically increased in this uh, this time period. So, looking at the outcome of patients uh, in, in a formal setting uh, was something which uh, on which we adapted in order to be able to generate data to guide best the treatment of patients with uh, with cancer. And with that, actually, if you look also at the number of clinical trials which were open in this uh, period and uh, uh, the number of newly opened clinical trials, you can see that, that there is a slight drop, but which is uh, actually not, uh, not really significant. The number of newly activated clinical trials remain basically uh, very similar. So uh, on the basis of that, you, you, you may say that's one center. What about the other center? What I looked at here uh, is uh, uh, the total number of trials which were activated in this Unicancer uh, Federation. We can see here in the different center, which were uh, uh, not marked, that uh, uh, when you compare to 2018, 19, and 20, there is a wide variation of, uh, uh, of uh, activation in the different uh, cancer centers, but overall, it remains stable as what we observed in our, uh, in our center. The total inclusion remain relatively stable also, even though there were very much differences across the different centers, some in particular uh, investing a lot on a registry trial, what happened actually is a, a strong reduction in the number of clinical trials which were sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical industry for several uh, reasons. The, the, the first reason being probably that uh, uh, many uh, companies 
put some trial on hold, at least during two to three months during uh, uh, this, uh, this period. And if not, some of the uh, trials actually were not uh, 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 worked on by the uh, uh, physician and inclusion was not uh, conducted as we do usually in this time period. So reduction of uh, uh, inclusion, but an increase in the number of inclusion in, into registries. And this reduction in inclusion in therapeutic trial was observed mainly on uh, phase one uh, studies and on pharmaceutical uh, company sponsored trial. But we had patients on trial. So how do, did we manage the patients uh, into clinical trial during the, the lockdown? The first strategy was uh, what we did for all patients, but which, were, which is really practice changing, which are our teleconsultation. And I'd like to give this number, which is that in the eight weeks before the day one of the first lockdown, we did 25 teleconsultation, which was basically a failure. And in the eight weeks uh, following uh, the first day of the lockdown, we did five more than 5,000 teleconsultation. Uh, this was for all patients, of course, not only for clinical trial, but this tells you how um, um, importantly the practice has changed with this, uh, with, with uh, all this. So some inclusion were altered more, mostly in, uh, uh, in, in pharmaceutical company trials, less frequently in academic uh, trial. What was also adapted where are the procedures? And actually, there are many companies accepted the ideas of uh, uh, following the patient through teleconsultation, of course, without a physical examination uh, formally conducted by the investigator. But if uh, the uh, investigator uh, thought it was necessary, a, uh, a local doctor could perform the medical and physical examination and uh, um, send information to the, uh, to, to, the local, uh, to the local site. Uh, we had complexity which could be resolved in the shipment of experimental products. This was uh, very challenging and very demanding for, both, for the pharmacy of the uh, hospital. This proved to be feasible and probably contributed to the feasibility of the clinical uh, trials, uh, therapeutic clinical trials in this, uh, in this period. What also did change, uh, and I mentioned that already with the registry, is the COVID-19 trials, which were activated absolutely in record time. And we are, I presented these different trials already at the beginning of, of this presentation. I must say that even though we are extremely critical of our uh, administration on the, uh, the speed of activation of the studies, these studies were activated in record time, in six days from uh, uh, final version to approval and first patient included in, in the clinical trial. So that proves that this can be feasible if uh, in uh, circumstances uh, like this. And what was interesting as well, that we could generate clinical trial extremely rapidly. This one dedicated to cancer patients infected with COVID. We had seen these patients with a, a very poor outcome. And we had started to get some information from our basic research laboratories that probably some mechanism could be um, uh, identified as causative of the uh, alteration of uh, um, lung function in, the, in this patient. This led us to develop quickly a uh, uh, randomized clinical trial in COVID-19 cancer patient population to try to test this hypothesis which were uh, generated in preclinical experiments. Again, a very quick capacity to activate clinical trial. One of the problems, however, is that because we were uh, treating only cancer patients with, uh, with uh, COVID-19, which were ex excluded, by the way, of other trials, in, uh, at least in this uh, city and uh, in the country uh, mostly, is that um, the number of patients was actually lower than, uh, than expected, able to uh, jump in these clinical trials. And actually, we have uh, still this clinical trial open, but with a relatively slow uh, accrual. Final uh, uh, points uh, on this uh, uh, question of how to manage clinical trials in, uh, in the period of uh, uh, pandemic is uh, to promote the use of vaccination as quickly as possible in these patients with uh, cancer, whether they are or not into clinical trial, but particularly if they are in, into clinical trial. This was somewhat complex because we had, uh, of course, to uh, discuss that in, uh, in detail with the um, pharmaceutical company or the sponsored uh, involved. This proved to be quite feasible and quite active, and this is actually taking a lot of work within the uh, current uh, uh, state of work of, uh, of our hospital. I will conclude here. 
by saying that uh, uh, the pandemic had a, a, a very spectacular impact on clinical research in cancer, but probably the most important impact is that uh, it was possible to keep uh, a significant activity despite the complexity of this uh, uh, period and the global impact on the healthcare uh, system. We could keep activation of the uh, trial to, to some uh, extent. We could pursue the inclusion of patients to clinical trial, maintain the follow-up of patients into clinical trial, even though it was, uh, it was reduced. One of the aspects of this is probably, even though I do not have direct comparison and numbers to show to you, it was much easier to do that in comprehensive cancer center as compared to general hospital, including general university hospital, because they, were, uh, they had this tsunami of patients with COVID, which was extremely difficult for them and actually send us sometimes a patient for, 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 for care. It was possible to generate at high speed clinical research for COVID-19 cancer patients, uh, even though it was complex because of the complexity of the disease. And with, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Jean-Yves. <clears throat> and uh, as I said before, uh, to those that are in attendance, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box on the right bottom corner of your screen, and we will make sure that Professor Blay gets that question. Um, maybe it's nice to look at the poll back. Mike, can you show the slides again, the slide on the poll? Jaif, if you look at the slides now, and you've given us basically the answer in your institution uh, during your talk, um, can you dwell on this a, a little bit? In this case, people at least expected that you would say that there would be a major reduction in the number of patients in clinical trials during the first lockdown. Basically, you said there was a reduction, but it was not major. It was, if anything, it was modest, you could say, but in some institutions, in some cases, even minor. And the other issue is the number of newly diagnosed cancer patients decreased significantly in the first lockdown. You indicated it, it decreased, but it was certainly not to the extent that people were worried about. So the the answers that he, that people gave, in, in at least the expectations that people had, were in contrast to the information that you have given. Could you dwell on that? Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. I, I, I must say that was a surprise to us uh, to us as well. We expected uh, that the activity of uh, um, of clinical trial would be much more significantly impacted by the first lockdown in particular. It proved to be not the case in this institute. And as you rightly point out, this is, I think, mostly related to the fact that we are a specialized cancer institute in uh, the sense that we do not have these uh, uh, emergencies of patients with severe COVID coming to a university hospital or general hospital or a, a clinic which actually um, needed attention and ne needed um, a, a reorganization of the medical unit. These hospitals were significantly impacted, probably much more significantly impacted than the comprehensive cancer centers who treat basically patients uh, with cancer and COVID, but mostly patients with cancer. And that's probably one of the lessons I would take from this uh, uh, pandemic is that uh, these specialized hospitals probably have a very specific role to play in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of set setting. And for the second question as well, I think that was a bit of a surprise. We were quite worried uh, looking at the first publication of our friends from UK showing a, a dramatic reduction on, on, on the number of patients coming to the hospital because of COVID in the first lockdown. And um, we thought that it would be, uh, it could be similar in, uh, in our hospital. This proved not to be the case, even though there was a reduction, it was only for newly diagnosed patients. I must say again that probably in a sense that was a, a, a situation which was contrasted across hospital in, the, in this country and probably in other countries as well. Again, general hospital, uh, university hospitals um, who treat all patients were probably much more impacted. And I, I think that if you look at the global numbers in France, the impact on cancer centers for newly diagnosed patients and uh, the impact on general hospital was fourfold less actually in comprehensive cancer center, which 
uh, still remain in uh, of a magnitude of uh, um, of 25 percent in non-specialized hospital, which is significant. Uh, less in cancer center, still significant. The impact on survival, long-term survival, is going to be significant, but we'll see that in the future. Yeah. How many of the patients in France are diagnosed and treated in the comprehensive cancer center versus the university clinics it's, a, it's, it's about the general hospitals? Yeah, it's about 23% of patients treated in, in, in these comprehensive cancer centers of the Uni Cancer Federation in France. Mm -hmm. So that's one-fourth about. But it means that 75% clear... of the patients were treated or not treated elsewhere. Yeah. But it becomes clear that the cancer centers are more resilient. Uh, could you formulate um, two things? One, from your experience is being so re re resilient uh, in the pandemic, in the treatment of cancer patients, uh, what would you recommend to non-specialized or non-cancer center hospitals? What are the lessons that they could take away? And also uh, the same thing for the clinical trials. Uh, that are run at other institutions? I, I, I would certainly um, recommend on the basis of the observation that we have made that some sectors, including oncology, hematology, should be protected from the waves of patient coming. Of course, we have to treat the patient, no question mm -hmm. about that. But we also have to treat cancer patients. And by formally protecting uh, some areas of the hospital, mm -hmm. uh, which should be reserved to patients with cancer, to patients with uh, strokes, uh, myocardial infarction, and so on, is certainly wise. Of course, that's easy to say, uh, much more complicated to organize when you have such large waves of uh, patient coming, but probably that's a, that's a signal which is interesting. And if not organized this way, at least organize a collaboration with a nearby hospital which is specialized. And this is actually what we did. Um, the, uh, our colleagues from the other side of the road uh, were actually asking us to come to treat their patient in the hospital and we organize that. So collaboration is a key, I think. Mm -hmm. And also probably communication. I think one thing we've, we've learned from this experience is that communication as directly as possible to the patient or to the, to, to the uh, person who doesn't know yet that he or she is a patient is, is crucial. Come to the hospital, reassure the patient that all precautions are taken to ensure that they go, are not going to get contaminated is something that we have tried to implement, possibly a bit late, um, and this resulted in delays in, uh, in patient coming, but that's something on which we, we, we should work. And uh, for clinical trials, do you have any specific recommendations for people running clinical trials? Yes, I, I, I think first, of course, the, uh, um, the clinical trials which on, on which patients are already included and in receiving the treatment should be uh, uh, protected as much as possible. One of the big lessons is that uh, it was feasible, of course, with sometimes major adaptations to the protocol. But this proved to be feasible to key patients, uh, including to crossover patients, sometimes when, when they were doing their CT scan on another part of the country because they were coming from, uh, from far away and deciding on switching the treatment. Things we would not have imagined to happen could, could, could take place with uh, flexibility commitment. And uh, I, I, I think... Um, uh, uh, Again, communication with the sponsors, because uh, what I think which was crucial is that the discussion which took place enabled to adapt, to adapt to patients who were included and to adapt to patients who joined the, the, the clinical trial. I, th I, I think there are many clinical trials which were kept open because they were relatively simple. And even though the patients were uh, not coming as, uh, as we all, or as we hoped they, they, they would be, uh, that there was no reason not to include them because the, the procedure of the trial, in particular in academic trials, were relatively easy to implement. And basically, at the end of the day, we have to do uh, our work and doing our, our, our work uh, in circumstances when we are somewhat protected from the uh, uh, pandemic is, is something which is, of course, mandatory. Of course, it was a bit more difficult, and that's something we observed. The number of patients included in pharmaceutical company sponsored trial decreased. Um, this, even though we do not have 
um, um, precise number of, 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 on this. I think this is related mostly to the early phase trials. And this is because, of course, these are complex procedures and sometimes alternative options were proposed to the patient instead of, uh, of, these, uh, of these trials. Um, in, in a way, the answer I would, get, I, I would uh, provide to your second question is very similar to the one I would provide to your first question, which is to protect an environment which enables that to be, to be constructed. That's probably the safe, safe way to organize things. Again, again, when it is possible, because it's not as if you were in control all the time. Thank if you. you look at the, that, the trial uh, participation, you say, well, it mostly reduced in phase one or the early clinical trials because of the complexity of those trials. Um, you've shown the slide from the cancer centers within the UniCancer. Uh, I think the largest reduction in one side was 25 to 30% in, in inclusion. Right. And the most of it was quite considerably less. So it is it's less worse than we expected it to be. Do you have any information how this was in the non-cancer centers uh, in, in France? Do they have a similar limited decrease or is this, the decrease there bigger? Uh, I, actually, I do not have this global information for the other non-specialized cancer center, uh, centers in, in France. The, the message from my colleagues was that the magnitude was more important. Still, they kept an activity which remained significant. Uh, in, in other words, they did not re, uh, decrease by 90%. It was more in the range of 50%, about of the same magnitude that the, the impact they had on newly diagnosed patients because for uh, exactly for the for the same reason so it's not a massive drop actually of patients not including to clinical trial again uh the trials which were uh active were mostly relatively simple trials and uh, um late stage trial instead of uh, first um, first in first in human or phase one or phase two clinical trials we have um, a, few tr a few questions that have come in via the Q&A function, and I would like to encourage our participants, uh, attendees, to type in new questions. And the first one comes from Judith Taylor, and she asks, what are the key points you would like patients to be aware of? Um, actually, we... Uh, th this is a question of, on communication. I think one of the crucial steps to take very early in these uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary circumstances is to communicate as quickly as possible to all patients, the patient we know and the patient we, we, we do not know. Reassure them uh, and explain to them as, as easily as possible uh, how to come to the hospital and to make uh, them understand that this is safe to get to the hospital because the procedures have, have been uh, organized. Um, so it's less um, a message to the, to the patient that the organization of the communication towards the patient, is, which is crucial. Uh, many centers, including university hospitals and cancer, comprehensive cancer centers, uh, have been sending messages to all, uh, email messages to all their patients to explain to them what was going to happen uh, and that proved to be extremely helpful. We generated hotlines to discuss with the patient and the hotlines were very much used in the first 15 days. And then people were instructed on how to proceed and it worked not that bad at the end of the day. Um, so the patient must be aware that it is safe to come and it is in particular for, to get treated for cancer. And I, actually it is not uh, safe not to come. Maybe uh, related to patient care, um, the, there's another question from Alain Sadoun. What was the policy with regard to COVID-19 vaccination in patients included in clinical trials, particularly those uh, that were testing new uh, investigational medicinal products? But you could say in general, what was the policy for cancer patients to be vaccinated or is I the policy? Uh, generally, we received a precise instruction from the sponsor on how to proceed and which vaccine was ac ac acceptable and which was not acceptable in this case. Um, I, I must say that uh, the vaccination pace started slowly in my country. And, and we were not that overwhelmed by this question in the weeks of, uh, in the months of uh, uh, January and February. Now it's starting to catch up uh, quite significantly. Actually, the majority of our patients are now va vaccinated. Uh, general policy, vaccinate everyone. But we also know, and that, that has been already published, that the uh, 
uh, impact of vaccination on strongly immunosuppressed patients may not be as good as we expect. How do you deal with that? Do you measure antibodies or how do you deal with these patients, you know, you, uh, who may be in the midst of cytotoxic therapy or immune oncology therapy and where we would fear the vaccination is less effective? Uh, I, uh, the, the way we have organized this is, uh, is twofold, actually. There is a prospective clinical trial, one of the clinical trials which uh, uh, type registry that we were discussing, which collects this information prospectively to see whether, what is the immune response. And when I say immune response, B-cell response, which means ba basically uh, antibodies against the spike protein, which is probably the most relevant um, uh, biomarker uh, indicating uh, uh, protection. Um, so we, we look at that within the, the context of this uh, registry and also routinely as much as we can, in particular in those patients who are strongly immunosuppressed and lymphopenic, which is happening, of course, in a, in a large majority of patients. Now, when you have a patient vaccinated twice with no detectable antibody, comes the question of should we get a, a, a third shot? And uh, that's something which is always debated. We have dedicated the multidisciplinary tumor board dealing with this question actually in this center. Maybe related to uh, clinical trials, Jean Yves, you mentioned that the death rate in the early days of the pandemic, death rate uh, in patients with cancer that died due to COVID was quite high. Um, uh, it's 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 decreased fortunately now, but if those patients are in the clinical trial, that could affect the outcome of the trial. Yes, likely not in a in a randomized trial because then you would hope that at least the arms still are balanced in this case. But in a non-randomized trial, this would certainly negatively affect uh, the uh, the outcome if survival to some extent is part of your assessed uh, outcome parameters. How do you deal with this? How did did you deal with this? Uh, actually, that was, I think, the major reason why uh, pharmaceutical company sponsors instructed us to stop to halt accrual for some uh, some of uh, specific trials. And and not surprisingly, as you rightly point out, trials with, without control arms, uh, and trials with uh, uh, where survival was a key endpoint. It's always a key endpoint, but that's a primary or a secondary uh, endpoint. So that, that was a proportion of the trial which um, which was. Not, not a majority, but that was one, one of the reasons. Now, having said that, I look at my center, but for, for this, uh, we, um, uh, I do not have the full data set of, uh, of the federation, but in my center, the proportion of patients who uh, were into clinical trial who get infected and had a, a fatal outcome after a COVID-19 infection was much lower than the general population of cancer patient being treated in this center for obvious reason of selection. Right, so you would expect that in the, the patients that were in the clinical trial, there would not be a similar uh, effect as far as compared to patients that are not in the clinical trial. Ex exactly, and this right. is actually what we observe because of patient selection, better performance status because, and they were included. And, uh, um, and, and that's something, but I must say, I, I would be cautious with these numbers, which are crude numbers from one sure. center, but the difference is quite, quite visible on the curves. Yeah. Well, this may be one of the reasons why some people are somewhat cynical on patient selection in clinical trials, because it's not the real world that we're testing there. Yeah, probably. This basically tells you that. And another question, you, you, you open new studies in record time. Um, I guess we could also say, well, the development of some drugs was done in record time. Just think of the vaccines that were basically developed in uh, under a year's time, which has never happened before. Um, most of the studies that you opened were registration studies, which I guess uh, have less of an issue with the uh, ethics boards and the uh, people that have to uh, approve the, the clinical trials than prospective clinical trials could have. Is that indeed the case? Was that reason for this um, or the, the explanation for this tremendously rapid start of clinical trials within six days? I mean, uh, that is really amazing. Uh, you would hope that a pharmaceutical uh, tr company trial would ever get opened within six days. So mm -hmm. is the registration type of trials the reason 
or what are other reasons? I, I, I think obviously the when you have trial without therapeutic intervention, it's much quicker. And indeed, it was uh, it was done some, in less than one week, quite quite often at the beginning of the pandemic. But also, this happened with trials testing new agents, including early new agents dedicated to COVID nineteen. And uh, I think for us. Uh, clinical researchers in oncology working in France that was particularly striking because we always fight with our, with our administration saying that they are much too slow to activate clinical studies. And in this very case, they were able to, uh, to, to, uh, to do that in record time. So that was not seven days, but uh, I think all the COVID trials dedicated to COVID patients uh, were activated in less than one month, at least in the uh, in the first month of 2020. So that's probably uh, uh, still the case as we speak with new antibodies, new new vaccines which are, are ongoing. So th there was really a big effort uh, mm -hmm. on that, at the expense, I must say, also of the activation of the other trials uh, for which uh, the, the speed of accrual, the speed of uh, uh, activation, was not that different actually. You mentioned that some of the companies, uh, the four company sponsored trials, halted the accrual or recommended recommended the halting of the accrual. Were there actually any studies opened in this period? Any new pharmaceutical company related studies opened? There were uh, in the lockdown period of yeah. two months. There were very few. Very few. I do not have the number, but obviously very few, simply because it was very complicated to to, to move. So there were um, a vir a virtual teleconsultation activation, but that was marginal. I, I would I would say that this was mostly uh, opening new centers for academic studies. Um, this was the best that was organized when it was an absolute lockdown. Now after after the months of May, when where things were more open. Even though they were more locked down, which were less tight, uh, I, I think this happened. Yes, and this is actually uh, what happened in the second lockdown and the third lockdown in this country. Yes. And uh, you're currently in your third lockdown, if I understand correctly. We, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We are coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the coming days, hopefully. <laughs> if you could compare the first lockdown to this to, to this last one, as far as trial uh, activation and uh, trial participation is concerned, is there a difference between those two lockdowns? Is it? I mean, are we getting used to the lockdowns? Are we getting familiar with the, the pandemic, or is it, have things changed? Yeah, clearly, so the reduction observed uh, in in clinical trial accrual for um, uh, observed for, for pharmaceutical company trials was uh, is not anymore something we we have observed in the second and third. Actually, the the accrual and uh, new patients coming in in the hospital increased significantly in the first months of uh, 2021, probably because we were catching up the delays. But also, this was also observed for clinical trials uh, in general. So I guess that we probably uh, have adapted to that and are now able to conduct clinical trials with adapted uh, procedures. And this is working. Yeah. Maybe, um, is, is there a difference also here? But you mentioned that the, the, the experience is different in the, clinical, in the cancer centers, I mean, the, the specific cancer centers, as compared to the general hospitals and the university hospitals. How about the experience in those general hospitals on clinical trial performance? Do, do you have any information? Do you receive any information from your colleagues there? Well, to say, uh, yeah, we are um, one of the mission of this cancer centers is, is also to go to general hospital to work with them, uh, and this is what happened also during the uh, during uh, and, and after the lockdown. And clearly, again, they were much more uh, impacted uh, for for the um, uh, for the inclusion of new patients. They were also more impacted on the day-to-day -day monitoring of uh, patients included in, in, into clinical trial for the reason of uh, uh, people being uh, um, uh, committed to go to the uh, uh, infectious disease ward and, and so on, and not being able to, uh, to participate to, the, to, to their routine task. Um, there has not been formal measures of that, mm -hmm. uh, at least that I know of, but from the exchanges with my colleagues, the magnitude of the problem is, was much more important uh, uh, in this period. And I will suspect that when, when we will know the, the numbers, their numbers, they will probably in the range of three to four fold more impact as compared to what, what we had in, in our comprehensive centers. And that, that could 
at least have an influence also on the performance of clinical trials in, in general uh, yes. and the outcome of clinical trials. Do you have, I mean, missing data is a concern of everybody, certainly those that are working in industry now uh, in their trials, patients that were already on trial when the pandemic started. Uh, if they didn't visit the hospital, if you couldn't do the teleconsultation, then of course there is a, a problem of getting the patient uh, to a hospital for doing tests or getting even an interview. Do you have any information on the seriousness of missing data in non-cancer center sites? Yeah, we do not have this measure, but it was also, you know, uh, as cancer centers, we are also sponsors of academic trials, which involve all hospitals. And clearly, uh, missing data uh, were reported in all centers, including, uh, and, and, uh, and missing or delayed data are, are really uh, a, a concern for these academic trials that, that we are uh, promoting. Now, having said that, um, this, this delay has been slowly um, uh, recovered. Uh, and one year after this, this uh, extreme period of, of the first lockdown, I think things were, uh, are in a much, much better uh, situation. And we, we have less delays than uh, uh, certainly uh, we had in lockdown uh, one, as, um, uh, lockdown two and three are, are, is more favorable. The magnitude, I would say, twofold more delays and the missing data, uh, maybe more in some centers. You are a very experienced clinical investigator. You've run uh, an enormous number of trials in your life. Um, you've witnessed the, what happened in the, the various lockdowns on missing data in cancer sites and the non-cancer sites. Um, in the end, it may lead always, we, we don't know whether even in in, in, in uh, the trials that are uh, randomized, whether there will be a balanced difference in unexpected death or COVID-related death between the two arms. This could affect the outcome of trials that just happen to run it within the whole pandemic period of one and a half year now. Do you have any recommendation to the world outside there how to look at their clinical trials now and the outcomes of clinical trials? Yeah, I, I think looking specifically at the COVID period and the non-COVID period for a given clinical trial, which is expanding over years, is certainly going to be a, a, a recommendation. Also, when the clinical trial has two arms and uh, or several arms, and our, one arm is, is associated with a, a more significant impact on immunosuppression, that's something which which is going to be uh, um, which will need to be looked at very carefully. And also. One thing which is not simplifying this question that you're asking, Yap, is, uh, is that we have now learned how to best manage patients with COVID and cancer uh, with relatively simple measures. I'm not sure that these simple measures uh, were, um, were implemented at the same time in all centers. And, and that's going to be uh, one aspect of the variability of the answer that we are going to get, which we'll, we need to be uh, uh, cautious. What I would advise is certainly to have a very careful look at the COVID-specific deaths as a secondary endpoint to be added in the, in, in the clinical trial, um, and to look at the death rates in the different period where, where the trial were, was conducted, if it has not been conducted in, uh, uh, only in the, in the COVID per period. I think that's going to be a, a very important challenge when uh, when um, death rates are, I'm thinking in particular of uh, adjuvant studies, or at least when survival is, uh, is high, and when uh, uh, one or few deaths may, may make a big difference in an important trial. Well, um, uh, we've seen significant excess mortality in, in the general population. Um, and, and today a study was, was published that even this is yeah. underestimating the total uh, death rate of this disease. So do you have any registry data or other data that shows how overall in France or in, in the group of uh, centers where you have more data from, whether this was also the case for the general cancer population. Uh, we, we do not have yet this this, this measure, but I, I uh, I've seen the same data that you mentioned. I would of course be very surprised that we if we would not have a, a, a difference. I think in cancer patients we probably have maybe three different things. The first one is uh, that some patients with cancer in advanced phase um, infected with COVID uh, 
died earlier than they would have been expected. I mean, they would have had a, a fatal outcome due to cancer in, in the year, but I mean, their, their, their death was uh, was much before be, be, uh, because of the COVID. The second one is, I think the tools that we have for diagnosis of COVID have improved uh, in, the last, in the last year. And I'm very impressed by the survival curve of the patients. This is observed in, in, in this center and in the multicentric study, one of the studies I was mentioning, with more than 1,000 patients. I'm very impressed by the death rate of patients presenting with COVID symptoms and negative for COVID RT-PCR on several occasions. So these are truly non-documented viral infections, suspected viral infection because the CT scan because uh, and so on. And the mortality of this patient, and this is very unusual, the mortality of this cancer patient is exactly the same as COVID patients in, with cancer. So we probably have an underdiagnosed of COVID in cancer patients. Um, I would say, at least from this study I'm mentioning, to a magnitude of 40% minimum. Uh, and and uh, uh, whether we, this is also extending the general population is, is likely. Uh, so that may be one of the explanations of, of the point you, you, you are raising. So yes, I, I, I think the impact is, uh, is, uh, is quite significant, really. <coughs> Sure. As a, an immune oncology expert as well, any explanation why the uh, rate of PCRs was uh, false, maybe potentially false negative PCRs, because that's what I hear you say, was this high in cancer patients? That's very, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to understand. I have no explanation uh, why uh, th th this was the case. Um, I, I, I know that it was also uh, that's something which was reported from our colleagues, virologists, that uh, multiple sampling was often required also in general population. But uh, um, I, I do not have a, a, a real explanation why, whether if it, it is different in cancer patients as compared to the rest of the population. I think that the, um, the uh, quality of the, of the test uh, have very rapidly improved. Uh, and that's, that may be one of the reasons why um, we, we were so much worried to, uh, with our patients uh, in the beginning that we are probably proposing uh, a lot of tests at, at times where, where, when the tests were not that, uh, that good and probably have improved since, uh, since then. But no, I, I do not have a, a, an explanation. I think, I, I think one of the reasons why, why, why they do not develop an adequate immune response is also a mystery, by the way, <laughs> because yeah. uh, uh, spike antibody, okay, that's correlated, that's nice. But probably one of the um, uh, se series of publication which is going to come is showing also a T cell response, which is not easily measured, is probably the most important. And, and probably explain why some patients in general population, probably about 50% of the general population, by the way, have so minimal, so much minimal symptoms of, uh, of COVID-19 when, when it is do documented. So is, there is somewhat, something like a natural immunity, T cell immunity, uh, B cell immunity, which is something quite, uh, quite complex to look at. And finally, I, we also have seen patients who, who are very, uh, uh, difficult to to uh, to understand with uh, a profound immunosuppression, uh, minimal COVID nineteen symptoms, and uh, um, extremely high virus shedding rate for a prolonged period of time. There is a balance here between the immune system and Im immunosuppression, which is not well understood in cancer patient in particular, but not only in cancer patient, I guess. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We're getting to the end of this uh, webinar. I'd like to thank you, Jean-Yves, for a truly fascinating lecture. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the audience in initially had it wrong, at least on two of the questions that we asked them. So this is also a learning experience for all of us. Um, I thank you, all of, all of the participants, for joining this webinar. It's intended to be the first of a series on COVID-19 related webinars in cancer tri clinical trial performance. So um, stay alert, uh, look at our websites, look at our announcements. We're going to have more webinars in the months to come. Uh, as CDDF, finally, we always highly value your opinion on uh, the things that we do. So I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, survey on this webinar that you can fill out, hopefully immediately after you have uh, after you've ended the session. Uh, we will certainly make use of all of the information that we will get from you.
thank you all very much for joining. Uh, have a wonderful evening or afternoon and have a wonderful weekend as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.